I welcome everyone to this Bible teaching, Bible study session that we have every Sunday at 11 a.m. Nigerian time. I welcome you. God bless you mightily. We have been studying abiding in Christ. Put simply to abide in Christ. Our text is John chapter 15 verse 5. John chapter 15 verse 5. It was Jesus Christ that was speaking here to his disciples physically who were with him as he was preparing to depart this world because he knew his time was up. We read, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Let's take that again. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, Jesus Christ, I add for emphasis, you can do nothing. In our previous studies, we've highlighted the key words from this verse is number one, the vine, who is also called the true vine, according to verse one. And that is Jesus Christ. Number two, abider in the vine, abider in the vine who are the fruit bearers, or abider in the vine. Sorry, it is single according to this verse. Abider in the vine, who is fruit bearer. And also non-abider in the vine, who is a nothing bearer. Oh, I want to encourage you that you come to Jesus Christ, the one who is the burden bearer, that he may bear your burden and make you a fruit bearer today as you abide in him in the name of Jesus. We also covered in the previous study that abiding in Christ or to abide in Christ ultimately means one's personal relationship with Jesus Christ and invariable, invariably rather, invariably with God, our heavenly father. I take that again, that abiding in Christ or to abide in Christ ultimately means one's personal relationship with Jesus Christ and invariably God, our Heavenly Father. So take a moment and reflect. What is your relationship with God? What is your relationship with Christ? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The father also declared in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. John chapter 14, verse 20. John chapter 14, verse 20. Jesus again declared, I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Our relationship with Jesus defines our relationship with the father. And invariably, the degree or level of our relationship with the Father defines our relationship with Jesus Christ. We looked at four levels of relationships with God and his son, Jesus Christ. Four levels of relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. Number one is servant. Number two, friend. Number three, bride or spouse. Spouse or bride. Bride of Jesus. That's very specific. Bride of Jesus. And number four, son or daughter of God, who automatically is a brother or sister of Jesus. As I've made the emphasis, and we have discussed this different degree or level or aspects of relationships uh, previously. We have said today we want to go deeper into son and daughter relationships. Hence, father and son, father and daughter relationship. And again, let us reflect. What is your category of relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ? Are you a son or daughter of God? and therefore a brother or sister of Jesus Christ? Are you a son or daughter of God? And invariably, 
that is automatically a brother or sister of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants. This is why Jesus Christ came to this world. This is why Jesus died and rose from the dead to reconcile all human beings back to God and make them sons and daughters of God. Romans 8, 29. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, the son of God, Jesus Christ, our brother, our Lord and Savior, our master, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we see clearly there that Jesus Christ, the Bible, calls us his brethren. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, Hebrews 2, 12, the Bible says, I will declare your name to my brethren. And that is a quote of Psalm 22, verse 2, 22, Psalm 22, verse 22, where David, in the spirit, prophesied concerning Jesus Christ that he would declare God's name to his brothers and sisters. So you and I are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.13 says, here I am, and the children whom God has given me. Again, this was the prophecy that was in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, talking about Jesus, declaring before God about us as his brothers and sisters. Glory be to God. So beloved, we are children of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We are children of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. John 14, 17b says in this world, we are like him. So we are like him, Jesus Christ. First John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3 say, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. We should be called the children of God. Verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be like, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Glory be to God. For we shall see him just as he is. I want to pause here because we are in a Bible study. As we said, we want to look deeper into sons and daughters, and which automatically makes us brothers and sisters of Jesus. And we'll follow up with a few discussion um, back in John chapter 15 on the importance of abiding in Christ. The importance of abiding in Christ. Glory be to God. The scripture is clear and has established that we are children of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. So let's have the discussion. We want to discuss our relationship as sons and daughters of God who automatically are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ and want to go further to that from that and look at the importance of abiding in Christ. Now that we understand abiding in Christ is relationship with God and his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, because if you abide in Christ, you have a relationship with God. And invariably, you cannot abide in God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory be to God. And the level of your relationship with God determines or defines your relationship with Christ. Is that simple and clear? So now we want to look at sons and daughters, invariably brothers and sisters of Jesus. What can you say about this? What scripture jumps to your mind as we talk about sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ? What does this mean to you? What does this speak to you? 
Okay, I'll call Sister Comfort, uh, Pavio, and next, uh, Brother Sonny, because you shared something, and then we'll continue the discussion there. You have just three minutes to make your point, max three minutes. Sister Comfort, Pavio, please. Good morning. Please, can Brother Sonny go uh, first, then I will say it later. Okay, it thank you for much. that. Thank you for that. That's good. Brother Sonny, can you share? Go ahead, Brother Sonny. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Pastor, for the opportunity given to me. Uh, the importance that's attached to the to the fact that uh, we are the sons and daughters, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ is very clear in the Bible. I really pick a good example in what happens in the in Luke chapter fifteen the story of the prodigal son, we come to realize that uh, God as a loving father has enough to take care of us and is always merciful in everything that happens in our life. God is always ready to forgive and to love us within the limits of his mercy that we enjoy now. Uh, we are, all, we are all aware of the fact that uh, when that prodigal son left the father's house with the resources that the father gave to him as he demanded, after wasting the resources, and he came back to the father, his brother, the other brother was not very happy with him, and he was not happy with what the father did because he didn't understand what it means by the love of the father. But the father have to draw his attention to the fact that uh, he has enough, that he's always ready to forgive and to love. And that more importantly, that this is his son, not his servant, who had actually died. And by coming back, seeking for mercy, he has come back to life. And he was lost and he has come back and he has been found. And that goes a long way to tell us that as Christians, we don't have to judge one another. We don't have to condemn one another. We have to follow everyone as brothers and sisters with love. We have to learn from God, which is our father, who is the father of mercy and of love, and is always full of forgiveness. So there are a whole lot of things that we can actually learn from this, that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to help one another in encouraging them, even when they are weak spiritually, we have to encourage them although they might not actually do everything that God expected us to do at that at the beginning, it is our duty as brothers and sisters to encourage one another to stand in the faith, not to condemn. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, uh, Brother Sonny. I, I think I want us to dwell on some things you have mentioned before we add more. Uh, you have brought a very important Bible portion that often is misunderstood and completely uh, misinterpreted. Uh, and some key points are not brought on. So thank you that you have brought that. And it emphasizes a number of truth. Number one point that you have made, let's look at that, um, is the son, the ability of a son, as we spoke last Sunday, to reduce himself to a servant. And we should not overlook that. While God is merciful and God is love, let's not overlook the key message, messages that the story of the prodigal son paints. That it is possible for a son to reduce himself to a servant. And we saw that in Galatians chapter 4 verses one through seven. Let's note that again. And that's the story. One, the first point we must remember. He is a son, no doubt, but as soon as he pulled himself out of God and went into sin, he did not, the, the love of God did not diminish, the mercy of God did not diminish, but he had absolutely no access to it. That was point number one, but became a servant. 
no more enjoying the supply of the father. He unplugged himself. So it's important since you brought this, so we hit it right away. This is like the branch that, has, that is removed from the vine. So that's point one that we must remember in the story of the prodigal son. Point number two, again, why? A son, whoever has access, I mean, uh, the, uh, the love of the father and the mercy of the father and the forgiveness of the father abounds. This is one other mistake people make using the story of the prodigal son. The father never looked for the son. He did not. He waited patiently for him to make the move to come. And that's why people will say, will God destroy this whole world, the people he has created? God said to Moses, let me wipe off these stiff-necked uh, people, because, and I will raise out of you a nation better than them. That's God. The justice of God and the mercy of God. Yeah? They go hand in hand. So, the father was waiting for the son to come back. And the reason why the father does this is because a son that has taken himself and plucked himself out of the father's tutelage, the father's covering, inside, that is in mind, in thought, in heart, is actually a servant, not a son. That's the point. He needs to repent. And so it was when the son said, and the Bible says very clearly, and when he came to himself, he came back to himself. He came to realization. That's why we are preaching Jesus Christ. So men, people all over the world will come to themselves and know that God has sent his son to die for mankind. And that God is love and God is merciful. But that mercy of God stops in Jesus Christ and starts in Jesus Christ. Outside him, there is the wrath of God. And that wrath is being revealed and will be revealed even more. When we make this kind of statement clear, people say, oh, it's a threat. No, no, this is not a threat. This is telling you the obvious truth, untainted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The love of God is packaged in Jesus Christ. Outside Jesus, everyone else is a servant. Yes, people talk about the general mercy and all that. God has already done that. The whole world is by the mercy and love of God. So that's it. But the judgment of God will come. So number three point is that once a sinner therefore repents, whether the person was a son and then backslid and become a servant and still parade himself and uh, that is a son, okay, he's reduced himself to a servant. But once a sinner whether already a backslider or has never accepted Jesus, comes to God, then the love of God is always available. The mercy of God, the forgiveness of God is always available. That's what the story of the prodigal son teaches. Those three cardinal points. And we must never forget this. Because oftentimes people use this and say, oh, as the father for God forgave the prodigal son, he only forgave because the prodigal son repented. He didn't even bother looking for the prodigal son because he was no longer a son as long as he left the father's house. Yes, biologically he was a son, but at heart he had reduced himself to a servant. Galatians 4, read it again. He say a son, as long as he is a servant, I mean, as long as he is a child, rather a child, and who is a child? Somebody who doesn't know his right 
doesn't know his left from right and continue to fumble around, do all manner of things. It's not different from a servant. Okay. And then, like I said, so the fourth point then is once a sinner in whatever level comes to the Father, the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, our brother who has been crucified for us, the burnt offering that God has offered for us, for all mankind, becomes available to us. God bless you. So maybe there are other contributions before we move. This is the beauty of the Bible study. Let's not rush it. If this is what we emphasize today, we'll stay with that, please. Feel free to open the line if you want to contribute to this. Okay. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Yes. Good afternoon. Now, for me, what uh, the verse that really stood out for me is John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And verse 13 continues. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. I'm reading this from NIV. I think um, I'm very, very, very encouraged by the fact that I'm a child of God. We are children of God. Once we go to God, God has accepted us. When we receive Jesus Christ and believe in him, God has accepted us as children and as children just like john 15 from verse 1 to verse 5 talks about we are children we are connected to the vine who is jesus christ the true vine and the father is our father is a gardener so the first thing i want to mention is from verse 4 that we are branches. Jesus is vine and he's our brother. But this relationship is mutual because verse four, four talks about we abiding. He says, remain in me as Jesus speaking and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Mm -hmm. So this is a mutual relationship. We have to remain in Jesus Christ to be able to bear fruit. You can't say a branch will start bearing fruit. No, the, 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 the branch bears fruit because of what the vine has done. So we have to remain in him and he will remain in us through his word and other areas. So that is the first aspect that there's this mutual relationship between us and our brother. We have to remain in him. The second one is that there is, the other relationship is we have to depend on Jesus Christ. And that, that comes from verse five. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the branch gets nourishment from the vine, it gets the sap and it grows and then bears fruit. It's just like us two, we can't bear fruit or we can't get the sap, which I term as the grace of God, unless we remain in. So that's the, uh, the, the relationship of dependence. We have to depend on Christ to be able to bear fruit. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you, Thank you for those contributions. Before the next person speaks, um, let me just make a point. I, I, I... Um, Brother Sonny, while speaking, made mention of uh, the limit of his mercy, the limit of his mercy. Again, um, let's remember, I know he was just uh, using that, that point. The, the mercy of God has no limit. You know, the Bible tells us how high his mercy uh, and his love is. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, remind us of that. There is no limit to God's mercy. And our God is infinite, is limitless, and so is his mercy, so is his love. 
Okay, Sister Comfort, you had opened your line. So go ahead. Good, is it good day or good morning, the family of God? Thank you for the wonderful privilege you've given me. Um, like you said, this is amazing. I, I look at this as um, so a very important topic that understanding it will hold the key to our relationship with God and the way we serve God. So I, I look at it as Jesus' unique or special family. The family of God that is built on Jesus Christ. And you see the consistency of the scripture. The simplicity of the scripture that if we abide in the scripture and in Jesus Christ, the true vine, then I think the Holy Spirit will be there to guide us. So right from like sister has said, at me, I was also interested in Mark chapter three, verse 34. That scripture says, I'm reading uh, this, the children version of the NIV. <laughs> it says, then Jesus looked at the people sitting in a circle around him. He said, here is my mother. Here are my brothers. Anyone who does what God wants is my brother or sister or mother. I'm sure you know when Jesus made that reply before he was crucified. And then people say, behold your mother. He, he stresses who his brother is and who it will be. And Jesus stood by that word. He has not changed. So that is why after his resurrection at Matthew chapter um, 28, Matthew 28, there Jesus also said, he said, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So Jesus did not forget this, his brothers, this, his brethren. So consistency that Jesus look at us as his brother. So what a privilege to know that we are Jesus' disciple. Then also, after that, um, you have quoted uh, Hebrews 12, uh, 2, 11, and 12, where Jesus said he is not afraid, he's not ashamed of his disciple. So to bear Christ's image is to bear the emblem of that divine family. And when we bear that, we also share in the glory as co-heads with Christ. Just as Romans chapter 18, verse 17, we know that scripture. 18, as 8, 17 Romans says- eight. 8. Yes, Romans 8, chapter 18. 8, 18 says, we are suffering now is nothing compared with our future glory. Everything God created looks forward to the future, okay? So we will receive the glory as that of the son of God. And um, 29 says Christ will be the firstborn among the brethren. So Jesus refers to his apostle as his brothers, reinforcing the idea of salvation as a spiritual adoption by God. And so that changed their status to that of being the son, the, the son of God 
So you can see uh, following the scripture, Jesus' brothers, before he was uh, um, crucified, Jesus' brother after he has been resurrected, and now restoration because of this glory to that of the sons and daughter of God. Confirming that scripture of John chapter 15, where Jesus, like we have we repeatedly pointed out the first five and four. Jesus, we can do nothing except we abide in Jesus Christ. And uh, the seventh name says, first seven of 15. I always like that scripture so that we know that Jesus has re confirm and has affirmed who we are and the benefit of being the sons of God. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Okay, because... we'll, wrap it, we'll, we'll wrap it up here so that we can take other contribution. Thank you, Sister Comfort. Thank you, excellent. Great points, emphasizing again, brothers and sisters of Jesus, that we are and we are children of God. So, is there any other contribution before we will begin to pull this together? From all these contributions, there are a number of things that we can we can distill. And we're going to take action for what we've studied so far. Because remember, we started the study and we said we're going to look at the what, the why, and the how. So we're going to wrap it up with the why today, as many of us have discussed. And then we'll come to the how. The how is the crux of it. What are you going to do now that you know? How can you become a brother and sister of Jesus, the son of God? And how do you live and walk with this blessing, having known this knowledge? That's the next thing we're going to do in the next study, the how. Uh, so I know many of us have gone in between all that. Yes, it's fine. That's how it works. So very uh, uh, important contributions have been made. I, I believe a whole lot. The dimension of the prodigal son has been expanded and explained. And our focus here is that the place that God has provided for us is that of sons and daughters. And hence, we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of God, who are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And a number of important things have been mentioned. Why is this so important? Just imagine you, me, us being made like Jesus Christ. And that's who we are. You know, as people say that if one or any, if one does not know the use, the value of a thing, then it will abuse it or underutilize it. Of course, underutilizing is abusing it. I think that's the space we are, and many of us are, because we really don't know what is available to us and who we really are. We say it with mouth, and that's why this study, as our sister Comfort emphasized it, this is a very important study, because if we understand this, then how we live our lives and how we walk with God and serve humanity for God will change. How we carry on as ministers of Jesus Christ will change because everything is wrapped around the understanding of our personal relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. And our sister made a very key point that Jesus Christ is the center 
of our relationship in this family of God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Hence, the one who gives us access to God. And at the same time, having come into God, he's the one who leads us. That's where this position of the firstborn that Jesus is for us must be clear. So I want to again emphasize that 1 John chapter 3, uh, 1 John chapter 4, rather 1 John chapter 4, verse 17b. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17b says, in this world, we are like him. In this world, you are like him. In this world, I am like him. So all that Jesus did while in this world, you have been given the right, the authority to do the same. Are you doing that? Am I doing that? Are we doing that? So why is this important? A number of points just from what has been mentioned. Number one is that we have access to the love of God. We are in the love, in, in the love of God, both of the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, the beloved. That's number one point. We have access. We are in the love. We have all, uh, how, how do I want, I'm just trying to, I, I lack words to express this. So there is no, mm, no barrier, unfettered access, as people will say, uh, so we are in the love. I think that's the best way to describe it. We are in the love of God, both of his father and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's number one. Number two, I've already talked about it. Because we are in that love, we gain eternal life. We gain eternal life. These are all the things the scripture is talking about in 1 John chapter 15. Number three is that we bear much fruit. We bear much fruit. I want to look at fruit here as because some people at times will just say, oh, it's when you go and preach, that's when you bear fruit. Fruit here is not plural, it's singular. It's the totality of you, the fulfillment of your life here. So I want to, I, fruit is the totality of God's manifestation in you. All your achievements and fulfillment of purpose and goals make up fruit. So there is no separate you in your house. There is no separate you in the office. There is no separate you in the congregation, the assembling of God's people that uh, religious people often call church uh, in terms of the building where you go to, all right? But of course, we know the church as the assembling of the body of Christ, right? It refers to all those who are in Christ, individually and then collectively as an assembling, both spiritually and physically, yeah, as the Bible speaks, okay? So we bear much fruit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in us must manifest. I hope we're writing and noting these things down. And this is very important because this is about a life here, the manifestation of God in us while we are here. And that's why I'm always very careful teaching the truth around the prodigal son story. Because there are many people who say they are in Christ and they are still walking in sin. You are lying. You are not in Christ. You have long since taken yourself off Christ. Hello? The power of the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is able to sanctify us and keep us from sin. You still go about committing fornication and adultery and you say you are in Christ. Oh, because... The mercy of God and the love of God, you are a liar. It, that's that not how it works. When you come to Jesus Christ and you genuinely give your life to Christ and want to come out of any form of sin, the spirit of God sanctifies you and separates you from that sin. So any man who sins, when you have come to God, it is your will. 
your desire that you're sinning. That's the scripture. And that's the experience of those who have come genuinely to God. You suddenly experience the peace, the love of God. We can go on and on. So I'm just taking the big ones because as I just mentioned, the peace of God, you will say you enjoy peace. There are so many things. So I just want to cap capture it this way that you do everything. You receive the grace to do everything Christ did while here on earth. And then we have access to all the provisions of God in Christ Jesus. We have access to all the provisions and the blessing of God in Christ Jesus. So peace, everything, whatever you can think of is there. And then finally, we have access to divine secrets, divine information. And this comes by the Holy Spirit. So you have already received the Holy Spirit. That's what makes you a son and a child of God. We have explained that because I know some people will say we have access to the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. When you come to God through Jesus Christ, he gives you the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit in you, in me, that make us sons and daughters of God. That's what it really means. Romans chapter eight that our sister mentioned, I think we need to read it again from uh, verse uh, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit of God. In fact, let's go back to verse 9. Look at verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So there are people who are not confident that they have received the Holy Spirit, and yet they say they are Christians. The only thing that makes you a Christian, and indeed a child of God, is that you have received the Holy Spirit. So if you have come to God through Jesus Christ, you confess your sins to God and ask God to forgive you, and have acknowledged the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, who was ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father for interceding for you and me, interceding for us, then ask God to give you his Holy Spirit. His Spirit, as we have studied first, will manifest through transforming your life. That is by the fruit, the fruit of righteousness the fruit of the spirit. And we've again, let's bring that into this fruit study here. What does fruit mean? It is that with the outcome of the maturity of the plant, of the, 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 the branch, right? Of the tree in its season, right? So it reaches the time and it brings forth fruit. So the spirit of God in us produces his fruit. And that fruit is righteousness. So you cannot be in walking in sin and claiming that you are a child of God. It doesn't work that way. And that's not true. If Christ dwells in us, the spirit of God dwell in us, dwells in us, he manifests his fruit. He produces his fruit. So the act of sin, therefore, is a deliberate choice. And again, the consequence of that is that we reduce ourselves, those sons, to servant level, servant relationship, separation again from God. The same way it happened to Adam. That's what we've done to ourselves. Taking ourselves back to the Adamic level rather than walking in the Christ's relationship that we have received. So verse nine there makes it clear, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ in him, he is not of his, he's not in Christ. And then we go back to 14 that, that I talked about, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So we are children of God by the spirit of God that is in us. Praise the name of the Lord. So this is my child from the scripture. According to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I just look at 1 and 2. It says, Beloved, behold what manner, and the one who asks, Beloved, eh? behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Beloved, verse 2. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I ask you a question. When do you want him to be revealed in your life? I charge you don't wait anymore because it is the Holy Spirit that reveals him. If you have the Holy Spirit, he will reveal himself. Just like the, the, the vine, the branch will be a fruit. If you have the Holy Spirit, he will reveal himself. He will reveal Jesus Christ to you. And you will know that in this world, you are like him. I am like him. We are like him. And therefore, if we are like him, we've been given the power to do what he did while he was here on earth. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus Christ said, we will do what he has done and even greater works than this we will do. I want to charge you, brothers and sisters, rise up now. Take your place as a son and daughter of God. And as a brother and sister of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. For God has created you, created me. In the image of his son, Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that we read, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Bible says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, the son of God, emphasis mine, might be the firstborn among many brethren. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the Bible says, for the endless expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing, the manifestation of the sons of God. The creation is waiting for you. The creation is waiting for me. Your family is waiting for you. The whole world is waiting for you. It's waiting for me, for us, the sons and daughters of God, to rise up and manifest because we are like him, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spent only uh, by record 33 and a half years on earth. And in fact, spent barely three and a half years doing his ministry. Within those short period of time, Jesus turned the whole world right side up. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Beloved, this is what it means to be a fruit. Abiding in Christ, Christ himself will cause us the branches to be a fruit. To become the fullness of Christ. To attend to the statue of the measure of the fullness of Christ for our life. It is time for you to manifest as a son, as a daughter of God. You got to arise. Brothers and sisters, you got to rise up and take your place. We've got to rise up and take our place. Remember that no Christian is a servant in terms of relationship with God. We are sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus. We belong to the same genetic component, if you want to call it that way, that is the Holy Spirit. 
You see, very simple illustration. There are certain families that are known for certain things. For example, a family that is athletic, you will see that the brother, the sister, they will be so athletic and everyone will excel. We belong to that family of Jesus Christ, that family of God. We are like him. Jesus Christ is victorious and we are victorious. He has overcome the world. He has overcome the devil. He has overcome all. He has overcome sin. He has overcome death. He has overcome grave. And we are like him. As he has overcome, he has given us the power in his name and by the help of the Holy Spirit to overcome. Glory be to God. Yet you know, Jesus Christ is our Lord. While he is our brothers and sisters, he is our Lord. He is the leader. He is our leader. He is our king also. He is our savior. He is our Lord. So we relate with him with humility. We are to humble ourselves before him, Jesus Christ, our eldest brother, our captain, the firstborn from the dead, because it's only through him, through his name, that we have salvation and abiding in him that we can bear fruit. The almighty God, strengthen you, give you the grace, give me the grace, give us the grace to be everything God has created us to be in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. In our own family, have relationship, particularly as we, we also are fathers and mothers to our children, children, and then the children, our children to, you know, parents. Okay, so we're going to look at practically how we have managed this relationship because this example of us and the vine, as we look at it, also applies. You know, we've been praying against the spirit of rebellion in the house and family of the people of God, house of God, and in the family of the people of God. But this is the first assignment. Now, think about your relationship with your children. What have you done to make sure that they are bearing fruit? And fruit here, I mean being the very best they should. How is that relationship? I want to again draw us to Colossians chapter 3. If you have not been studying it deeply, please study it because that's the scripture that defines how we should be in our families. It defines everybody inside the family. It starts from verse 18. Or you start from verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Why submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord? Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. So wife is mentioned, husband is mentioned. 20, children, obey your parents in all things, in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Born servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Did you see that qualification? Masters according to the flesh, because that servant may have a relationship with God and is a child of God. 23 and has another master, hallelujah. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. There is no partiality. So, what will then befall those who do not abide in the vine? Number one, as we said, they are servants, so they're already out. And those who have come into the vine and then no longer abide, the scripture is very clear, they will be cut off. So it is dangerous to go from a fruit bearer because the vine is a burden bearer. Remember that he bears our burden, and especially since he is our eldest brother. He is our brother, is our captain, is our everything. He bears our burden. 
and turns us into a fruit bearer. Oh, I've exceeded my time again, forgive me. Into a fruit bearer, we are fruit bearers. And then the one that cuts himself off like the prodigal son or refused to abide in the vine, which is what we're gonna deal with next Sunday. How do we abide in the vine or not abide in the vine? We're gonna get very deep in this now. So the one who does not abide will be cut off. But the mercy of God, the story of the prodigal son where it applies is that anytime a sinner returns to God, God will show me. And returning to God is not to use your mind and say, oh, Father, God, forgive me. And you know, people are taught some of these very shallow things. It is the heart. It doesn't matter how many times you say, Father, forgive me. Oh, my dear God, forgive my sin. If the heart has not repented, it means nothing. That's why it is difficult to come to God and then just get plucked off and into sin and all that. It is difficult. I've told you before. Jesus said, the father who has given you to me, given uh, us to him, is stronger than all. There is no power, not the devil, not sin that can pull you out of his hand. The only person who can pull himself or herself out of the hand of Jesus is you, the, uh, the branch. It's me, the branch. I, the branch. That's just like the prodigal son story. He took himself out from the father's house. And so today, I want to encourage every one of us, come and abide in the vine. Jesus Christ, your brother, your captain, your Lord, our Lord, the one who has paid all the price required for you to have the fullness of God and of life. The Bible says that God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. The Almighty God bless you. Let us pray. We want to agree together and say, Heavenly Father, by your spirit, help me to abide in the vine, Jesus Christ, whom you have given to me, given to the world. Help me never to unplug myself from the vine. Please help me. And now pray, say, help me, O God, by your spirit to be a fruit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of service to achieve everything, God, you have kept for me to achieve in this life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Go ahead, pray that prayer for yourself. Take 30 seconds more. Pray for yourself. Whatever you desire, now go ahead and ask. Thank you, our Lord and our God. Let's bring our prayer to a close. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Almighty God strengthen you and keep you and keep me and keep us. The seal of God is upon you. Fear not. God will keep you. You will make it through the year 2021 in the mighty name of Jesus. Remember that our cover word for year 2021 for those who just joined is Psalm 91 verses 7 to 10. A thousand shall fall by my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked, because I have made the law. He is my refuge, even the most high, my dwelling place. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. That's God's word for you. The Lord cover you and your family. The Lord cover me and my family and keep us to continue to bear precious fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll see on Wednesday, 6 p.m. is Let Us Pray. Let's come together and pray. Thank you and bye-bye.